Jerry Reynolds show here at McCreary's uh, beautiful studio and uh, furniture warehouse, the finest furniture in the Sacramento area. And, and we've got a real special guest here today. I've just been looking forward to, to this hour for a long time. Uh, Mr. Doug Christie, one of the uh, obviously uh, best players to ever play for the Sacramento Kings and now obviously a, a TV voice for uh, your Sacramento Kings. So uh, let's get right to it. And uh, Doug, uh, welcome. Thank you, Jerry. I appreciate uh, the check is in the mail for all those kind <laughs> words. <laughs> well, I know better than that because you're, you're, you're not as cheap as me, but you're, you're probably in the same uh, vicinity anyway. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. So, uh, you know, I, I really want to get into your background as much as anything. I, I think a lot of our fans certainly know you as a player and, right. and have great memories of, of your outstanding mm -hmm. career, which we'll get into. And then, and of course, know you as a TV personality now to, to a lot of degree. I and, apologize. Uh, but, but I go back, I want to go back to, of course, you were born in uh, May of 1970 in Seattle. Yeah. Yes. And uh, uh, that's your home. Uh, I, I noticed a. You, you gave a lot of credit to an early coach, uh, Dave Denny. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, that? You know, there was, there was a, a few coaches when I, when I was coming up, but Dave Denny introduced me to the fundamentals of the game of basketball. So my, uh, my mother was white and we lived in the hood. Mm -hmm. My dad was black and he lived in a all white little small town. So I was, so all you mixed were all up. messed up. <laughs> okay. Um, but so growing up learning basketball, I just learned in the streets and on the playground. So mm -hmm. I never had any fundamental teaching. It was just, you know, I kind of got by. So I go to Longview where my mm -hmm. father lived. It was about an hour and a half south towards Portland from mm -hmm. Seattle. Um, and I enrolled in um, Cascade junior high school and then ultimately um, Mark Morris High School and Dave Denny was the head coach at Mark Morris Mark High Morris. School. His son, Jeff Denny, was my best friend mm -hmm. at, at that time. And so I, I learned about jump stops and pivots and we used to do these drills where we'd jump up and touch the backboard and different things. So when I went back because unfortunately, Jerry, I, I got in a lot of trouble in both places, Seattle yeah. and Longview. But when I went back to live with my mother, uh, I found that a lot of those fundamental principles mm -hmm. made me excel vastly superior to to guys who I was either less than when I left mm -hmm. or equal to. And I, I always thank Coach Denny for that because w without that exposure, mm -hmm. you know, ultimately, I, I'm, you know, I would have maybe got it, but I think it really helped me in high school because I went from, when I left him, I couldn't make the varsity team. Mm -hmm. I went to Seattle, the number one team in the state. Yeah, Rainier, Rainier Beach. Beach. Uh -huh. I didn't play as a as a sophomore, but I made the team. And as a junior and senior, I was the MVP of the state. I know. I was yeah. getting ready to say yeah. that. And, and your team won the state, right? Yeah, we were. Um, so when, when I got there, and th this is the other guy I give a lot of credit to, is Mel Williams. Mm -hmm. And Mel was the first guy that ever told me I could make it to the NBA. Really? Yeah, we were having a real, you know about bad practices, Jerry, mm -hmm. right? So we're having a bad practice. And this is my junior year so now i am you know I'm, I'm playing a little bit and you know feeling myself and we're having a bad practice so he blows the whistle boop, brings everybody in and he starts ripping us and he goes there might be only one guy here <clears throat> that can make it to the nba so you know immediately we're all looking around like yeah, what the hell is he gonna we're, say we're, <laughs> <laughs> so and he goes on for a second and he, and he says doug and I just went, wow, you know, because he spoke power to my dream. Mm -hmm. And no one had ever did that. In my mind, tape delayed games as I watched Magic and, sure. you know, Larry and all these guys, imagine tape delay, right? Right. Uh, but in my mind, I wanted to go there, but I never thought that I would be able to get there. So from that point, you know, I really started, I tried to get out of trouble, you know, mm -hmm. not as much trouble, tried to do, do the right things. And um, we ultimately, in 1988, won Rainier Beach first state title and since then I, th I think we've won six uh Jamal Crawford Nate Robinson now Kevin Porter Jr. <laughs> we we, yeah, we got, yeah, we got yeah. factory there yeah. yeah you really do it's yeah. really been been remarkable yeah it's interesting you know you talk about the the fundamentals and all and I think sometimes 
obviously fans don't think enough about that, but, but I mean, it, it, it is one of those things I think as a young player, okay, now you started seeing the game differently Absolutely. as much as playing it differently. You yeah. had to see it differently. You know, and it, it fundamentals, I, and, and I speak about this with, with our team now and fans call the radio station and they're upset because they're thinking like, these guys get paid millions of dollars. What do you mean? They don't know how to play basketball. But ultimately, Jerry, I didn't really learn the game until I got to Sacramento. Mm -hmm. Imagine that. that was, I was, what, eight years into my career? Mm -hmm. And Coachy, Coach Pete Carrill, he opened my eyes to a lot of different things. So when we talk about fundamentals, you know, you have innate ability. Mm -hmm. You have really, you got quickness and speed and jumping ability and athleticism and anticipation and different things. But without the fundamentals, you can't execute them. Yeah. I, I don't, that, that's why you get guys and they'll go to the park and you see them in the summertime and they'll score 40 points and you go, man, that guy should be in the NBA. But you would be surprised because of, if I exploit something that you, it, you can't do and I put you in a bad situation and you can't make proper passes and timely passes and on time and on target passes, you end up on the bench and ultimately out of the league. Yeah, you know, I've always said, and, and I, I think you, you've seen it up close uh, in your careers, for every player that makes it, there's two or three of equal talent that don't. And they just kind of, just yes. because they, they really don't get, you know, kind of how they have to fit in, uh, what they need to do. Right. You those. know, Jerry, I wasn't the best player in my neighborhood. And I mean, you, you know, I mean, there's, as you say, there's three, four, five, and there were a lot of players in my neighborhood that I was better than, I mean, that I wasn't as good as. When I went down and I met Dave Denny, and I got the fundamentals, mm -hmm. and I paired that with what I had. I came back, and I was like, "Oh, no, okay, I'm better, I'm better than you. Than yeah. yeah, I'm better than you." And it—that's what began to evolve. And then, obviously, like when I talk about getting in trouble and stuff like that, at, at a certain point in my life, I wasn't willing to dedicate the time because I wanted to do different things. Mm -hmm. And a lot of, you know, some of my friends were into drugs and dealt drugs and got shot and different things like that. Sure. They weren't willing to sacrifice. And I was willing to, because I had a dream and I wanted my dream to come true. And the only way to make that happen is, are you willing to sacrifice of your life? And I was willing to do that. And here I am with you. Yeah. Well, <laughs> go, I, don't, go I don't know if that's a payoff, but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, here you are. But, you know, I, it's, it's interesting, too. You know, I, of course, I saw you play at Pepperdine mm -hmm. quite a few times because, obviously, you're on everybody's radar. Mm -hmm. And I uh, really did, really enjoyed watching it, by the way. Thank uh, you. I did. I did mean, you come you know, to Pepperdine? Yeah. Oh, that's no, no. what you, you yeah, enjoyed yeah, that more than. Yeah, oh, Pepperdine. <laughs> oh, wow. But I, I think the first time I saw you play was uh, at, at a, I think, your junior Maybe it's even so. I don't know. At uh, Lola Marymount during the conference tournament. Yes. Yes. And uh, you know, I, I I always remember sitting with uh, uh, Dennis Johnson, the great yeah, Pepperdine, DJ. Alum, absolutely. And we were just talking basketball, and he he was talking about how much he enjoyed watching you play. And I said, Well, yeah, I imagine you do. I said, He's got a lot of your game. Yeah. And and he said, Yeah, he does. He he he, he says he does. He's probably a little more athletic than me. But I said, Well, that's saying be. a lot. I said he may be, but I, I said you, you know, I'm not sure he had more than when you came in the league. Uh, I mean, because he was, uh, I mean, what a, a great player, just being, like yourself. Being from Seattle, he was one of my favorites because I grew up in in '78, '79. Yeah, the was championship the Bullets. Team. They, yeah. they won the championship. Uh, I got to meet Dennis Johnson. I mean, uh, Dennis. I got to meet Gus Williams, who was the point guard then from yep. USC. Uh, Dennis, Down, downtown Freddie Brown, downtown, Jack, oh, Jack, Jack Sigma, Sigma JJ. Oh, oh man, baby. That, that was a hell of a team. It was, and I I love Dennis because. First of all, he, he was a light skinned guy like myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I didn't have had the freckles. Fre yeah, I didn't freckles. have the freckles, but he could he he was athletic. He could do everything on mm -hmm. the floor. So um I finally got to meet him, meet him. One time at Pepperdine, he came there to do a um a commercial. So I was um that must have been my right around my beginning of my senior year, I think. And we just got to talk for a few minutes and say hello. And I told him those type of stories. And he was blown away because he was right. like, really? You're from the... Yeah, he was a uh, man. Uh, rest in peace. He was a great, great guy. Yeah, great, yeah, yeah really great player. You yes. Know, I, mean, I always remember it's one of those trades uh, that Phoenix 
had him and traded him to Boston for Paul Westfall. Yep. And it, and it really was a, t a trade that made both teams better. Yes, it did. You know, it gave Boston what they had to have to deal with Andrew Toney. Yep. And made him a championship. The Boston Strangler. The Boston Strangler. <laughs> and then Paul Westfall obviously could really became one of the probably top seven, eight, ten players in the league for a number of years there with his oh, man. being able to be the main man. You know, in uh, in in Phoenix, I but, could I could talk basketball anyway, all day with you. But I, but I was gonna say, yeah, it just it was just really interesting to me. You know, uh, of course I remember so well. You know, and you had the natural, you know, point and leadership skills at that time. You know, and I it's one of those things that I know later on when you were I followed your career a little bit, but but I mean when you're in Toronto, especially, you know, I always kind of remember. Well, yeah, he he was very comfortable. Yeah, kind of running the show. You know, so Coach Asbury, who is my my coach uh -huh. at Pepperdine, and oddly enough, uh, if a kid had to choose Coach Asbury, he probably wouldn't choose him because mm -hmm. he was a disciplinarian. He was in my face, but he was what I needed at the mm -hmm. time. And I can remember like it, it was yesterday. He, we used to do these drills called three lines. Do you know those where uh, John Wooden and they were oh, all yeah. the fundamentals? Oh, you know, yeah. Run, yeah. jump, stop, pivot, jump, uh, oh, just, yeah. ah, I hated it. But it got a lot better. So one day he's he's ripping me because that's what he used to do. And I, I'll have to tell you that story because it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> so he would, he, would, he would rip me relentlessly, Jerry. Like, I mean cussing me, just coming at me. And I finally, I just said, hey, coach, you know, can I come talk to you? And he said, oh, because right afterwards, he'd be, Dougie, great job today. And I'm thinking, what the hell yeah. is going on, man? So he uh, he calls me up to the office. I, I go up to the office. I meet him. And he's like, um, what you want, buddy? And I said, coach, I mean, what is all that, man? Why, why are you getting on me like that? And he said, close the door. I've been waiting for you to come up here and ask me this question. And I, so I looked at him and I, he goes, um, he said, you're the best player on the team. He said, if I do that to you, I don't have to say a word to these other freaking guys. They fall right in line. Mm -hmm. And right from then, we fell in the line. We didn't have any problems. He was uh, he was absolutely the best. Coach Coach Asbury was he was one of those things that as a young player, uh, uh, the the path that I went it just kind of worked out. He was he was awesome for me at that particular time in my career. You know, I, I've always you know thought too. It, it, that's one of those things they always said about uh, uh, Coach Popovich and Tim Duncan. Yes, you know, and he said that Tim allows me to coach yep. him, and obviously if you can get on. Tim Duncan. Yep. Uh, There's you, no problems. Yeah. Who who yeah. else can say anything? <laughs> you going to say something? No, yeah. I don't think so. And I mean, J Jerry Sloan used to tell me that too about Carl Malone. Yeah. And John Stockton. He Imagine. Said, he said, those are the two guys I get on. Yeah. And he said, you know, because what are the other guys going to say? They, they are going to, they are going to fall. And it, it, at but, that but, point. You know, but he said too, it's like, well, they'll, they'll allow me to. Yes. You right. know, I mean. And, they, and that was the. Th that was the vibe. I didn't understand it as a as a young player. I'm thinking, what uh, what is this? Why? I mean, I I'm better than all these. That's what I'm yeah, thinking in my head. Yes, I'm better so than why, all these why guys. Why are you not? These guys? Yes. Yeah. But that was a uh, that was a learning. So when you talk about being a leader, he I, I was the leading scorer on the team, and he called me into the office and he goes, uh, I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna make you handle the basketball, and I'm thinking, oh, we got a we got a point guard for that. That's what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. And he said, "You want to make a lot of money in this game, don't you?" And I, I was like, "Yeah, yeah okay, good, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, with yeah. that." Yeah. And he said, um, "He said, if you notice now, there's tables here every game, and if you walk in front of those tables, you will see Jerry West and yeah. Mitch Kupchak. You're gonna, they're yeah. here to see you, yeah, absolutely. And what you need to show them now." is what I'm about to do for you. So the next couple of games, I only scored like four points, but I had like 12 assists and 14 assists. And he said, see, these are things that other players on our team can't do. And this is what they want to see out of you. So his his pushing and prodding and, and making me uncomfortable mm -hmm. really helped me to to become a better individual, a better person, and a better leader. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, he was great. Now, I always remember too, you know, of course, after the uh, after your – college career you're a first round pick uh, of the seattle sonics yeah. which is your home but i know it yeah. it didn't the things did not go well i mean i i don't i don't know you, you know feel comfortable saying everything but but i mean it was yeah. just one of those situations that that 
you know, from afar, you'd say, well, that. You know, that'd be the greatest thing it, for him, but but it really wasn't, was it? Yeah, if if you look at my face when I got drafted, I wasn't very happy, mm-hmm. um, and that was unfortunate because you know just prior to that, all those stories I'm telling you about the Sonics, I was a big Sonics fan. I grew up and I loved Seattle. It, I mean, that was everything, and then all of a sudden, yeah, if Lenny Wilkins has still been coaching, there'd been a little better yeah, for you. That, that might that might have worked. <laughs> Lenny 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 might have worked for me, no doubt about it. Uh, but it was George Carl, and I had a, a run-in with George, and it it, w- it wasn't good. So then he, he called my house one time and told you know kind of cussed me a little bit and told me to get over here and work out. And I'm I hung up the phone, and you know I was young at the same time. But, sure, but. there there are ways that you go about, and even now that I've been around the front office, there's ways that you go about stuff and you handle it, and. Uh, so when I got drafted, I, I wasn't. I kind of knew it wasn't going to go good, and it wasn't going to be right. And I was villainized in the city, and it, it, you know, for for the guy. And his name was. I remember remember him clearly. But the year before me at number seventeen pick, his name was Victor Alexander out of sure. Iowa State. Yep, he got seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. So that year that I got drafted was Shaq and all, all mm-hmm. of us. Well, everyone got a 15% raise. Sure. So I, I should have been right around a million bucks or at least nothing less than seven fifty. Well, they offered me like $320,000. Wow. Yeah. So there's a, since been a, uh, uh, a little piece in the collective bargain agreement, I believe, that they weren't allowed to draft players if they knew that they didn't have the capital to be able to to pay them. And that was part of what happened to me. So it it was it was unfortunate. And really, to be honest with you, Jerry, up until I got to maybe Toronto, but definitely Sacramento, I lost the love for basketball mm-hmm. because it turned into a business. Because now all this, what is all this? I just want to play the game I love to play. And there was a lot of stuff. And yeah. I didn't really like that. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, it, uh, I think, you know, it, I always remember when you were at the Lakers. And, yeah. and I, I always remember, and I've told you, I had a conversation. I used to talk to Jerry West a lot. You know, yeah. Just different things around the league. But but I always remember, you know, I was asking, you know, how's how's Doug Christie? And, you know, and I've told and, and Jerry said, <laughs> Doug Christie is going to be a really good NBA player once he decide, figures out he ain't Magic Johnson. Right. And, and he said, he, you know, and he said, he said he's probably going to need traded a couple times yeah. to finally get it. Yeah, he, and, he was uh, right. You know, and of course, uh, that did happen. I mean, you went to the Knicks, and then, of yeah. course, and Toronto's where it really I, it seemed to kick in for you. It did. And, you know, Jerry lit into me in a summer league one time because it was just that. You know, I, I, Magic had just went through the HIV thing and left, and, you know, I'm thinking showtime. And, it, <laughs> and you know, and, and as a young player, I, I didn't know. I, I was just trying to, trying to find my way. So by the time I go, oddly enough, as I look back on it, there were so many – cues and different things that really helped me in my career. So I go from the Lakers and I go to the Knicks. First day that I get to the Knicks, they say, uh, Mr. Riley wants to see you in his office. So I walk in and sit down and I'm waiting and the secretary comes and says, go in. And I walk in and it's dark and, and wood. And he's like the godfather. Behind <laughs> yeah. <it. laughs> yeah. Huh. yeah. So I can, I can visualize uh, that. Right. Yeah. And, uh, and to, to Pat, he, he says to me, you're not going to play. I got my guys. We just went through training camp. You're not going to play. Find something that you can do in this league well, and it'll keep you in this league for a long time. So through Pat Riley and those crazy practices, I learned professionalism. And I found defense mm-hmm. because I really, you know, I could play it, but, you know, I'm, I was scoring, you know. Yeah. I really, so then I went from that to New York. And when I got, I mean, excuse me, from New York to Toronto, and Isaiah Thomas was the the general General manager. manager. He pulls me aside the very first day, and he goes, look, Doug, you're going to play about 48 minutes. I'm, you know, at least 40. Mm -hmm. If you get in foul trouble, whatever. He said, don't look over at the bench. We don't have any solutions for you. You go out there and play. If you make a mistake, try not to do the same thing two times in a row. Figure it out. I know you got talent. I know you can play. Show me. And that was the first time anyone had ever kind of released the, 
the reins on me and let me kind of... Yeah, where you knew, okay, now now I get to play. Absolutely. And uh, Damon Stoudemire was in the backcourt with me, and uh, who was a rookie of the year that year, Mm -hmm. and Tracy Murray and Walt Williams, who was Mm -hmm. here. Um, And I I began to... Now I begin to... So I put the professionalism, now am I going to stay with it? Mm-hmm. And and I did that. That was about the time I also got married, and I really started solidifying my life and what are the things that I want to do. And so by the time I got to Sacramento, everything began to kind of crystallize. Mm-hmm. Um, since then, you know, I my I can remember when I got married, my wife was like, you know, because she, she knew the story with George Carl and all that. Yeah. And she, we were in Seattle one night, and she goes, um, you know, you should just write him a letter take the high road. And I'm like, she said, say sorry. I'm like, sorry for what? That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. She said, that's not the point. The point is you, you release that, let it go, let mm-hmm. it out of your life. And I, I, I did that. And, you know, George sent me a letter back and kind of just let bygones be kind of moved on. Yeah. yeah. And I, I did the same thing. I didn't need this. It wasn't in that way. But uh, last year with, with Pat Riley and in sense with Pat, I, I sent him a letter. I, and his was more appreciative. I just uh-huh. wanted to let him know what he did for my career because yeah. that type of professionalism that he makes you, mm-hmm. oh boy. Yeah. You know, I'd when I say coming early, I'd get there about eight a.m. and I didn't leave till about eight p.m. Yeah. But you know, you're putting in a full day of work, but you learn as a young player how to be a professional. That's one thing I will say with Pat. I mean, I always remember us. Uh, we made a trade when you traded Walt Williams to Miami. Yes, yes. And Billy Owens and Kevin Gamble, and and really and made it really made the playoffs for us in '96. Uh-huh. And and I always remember those guys came in, and you know, you thought they were in the military. No doubt. I mean. Everything you know at their lockers, and, and I, I know, so I, I talked to both of them, and, and they said, "When you when you play for the Miami Heat and Pat Riley, oh, you, you you work and yeah. you do what you're told, and and yeah. all that." And and I, I mean, I, we, it was all great examples of it, no doubt. It, it was, um, you know, so remember, so when I came in, I had uh, my. The end of my junior year in the WCC tournament, I fractured the tip of my femur. And what I had it was equated to microfracture surgery. Mm-hmm. So that was an apprehension on me in the draft while I dropped a 17. Or yeah. Otherwise, well, I'd been, probably... Yeah, you, you were... Uh, I know early on, we're yeah. like a top seven, eight, nine, yeah, something right up there. there towards yeah. the top. Well, the apprehension was I'd only play five years. Mm-hmm. But when I got to Pat Riley, I learned a work ethic that enabled me to stay around for 15 years Mm -hmm. and it was because i i I changed my diet also when i got to toronto toronto and canada very forward thinking in nutrition and different stuff but lifting weights stretching flexibility all the different things and i i started to see how it helped me Mm -hmm. and so i i I went all in so when billy owens and those guys came i can already imagine i know they were like (laughs) yeah i mean billy was was really good i mean he still couldn't really shoot but he he and, and I mean, Walt probably, Williams always said, probably had far more talent. You know, we thought Walt oh, yeah, was the one whiz. of those guys, if he'd have really yeah. got it, yeah. like well, we're talking yeah. about. But he didn't. Well, no, he didn't. We <laughs> like to have fun. <laughs> yeah. He was a great but, guy, though. But he's a good guy. Oh, Absolutely my God. Absolutely a good guy. I drafted him. Yeah. Fact, High I, socks. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and he, but he should have been an all star. Really. Oh, no doubt. Six, uh, eight, handle the ball, handle shoot the ball. Strong. You know, really strong. Deceptively yeah. strong. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he had a little in the open court could make plays. Yeah, a little wiggle to him. Yeah, yeah. yeah Wiz could but, play. Yeah, but uh, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but that was a, I was thinking too, and I going back to, uh, you know, I was a, in, involved in the basketball operations at that time when you were at Toronto, and, mm-hmm. and and I always remember Jeff Petrie. We'd come off a you know a good year, a uh, uh, couple of good years, I think. But but you know we were kind of in the made playoffs two years in a row, mm-hmm. but. But you know, kind of stagnated. Yeah. I mean, and, and and you know, and I think sometimes fans don't understand. It's like, well, the only you know, it's like, yeah, this is a good team, but if you want it better, you you've got to make some changes. Yeah. You know, it just it's unfortunate, just, but it just, is, yeah. yeah, you just can't wait for the draft to save you or whatever. Yeah. Uh, that takes forever. Yeah. But uh, but he said, you know, I said, have you watched this Doug Christie up in Toronto? And I said, yeah, I watched him. He said, well, start watching him a little more. He said, you know. He said, "What you know?" He said, "I think I think he'd be a good fit for us, you know." And then so so I remember just having that conversation. And later on, you know, we were talking, and, and I 
And, he, and, and so he's saying what, what he had in mind. He said, you know, he said, I'd hate to do this, but he said, I, I think we could get Christie uh, for Corliss Williamson. He said, what do you think of that? And I said, well, I love Corliss. I said, but, but, I, but, I, but I understand. It's like, well, Paige has got to play. Yeah, at he, some point. He, you know, he, he fits a long-term thing here better. So, and I said, and certainly Doug, and I, 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 and I said, my feeling was, uh, I said, he'll fit J. Will. Perfect. I said, yeah, if possible, right? Because Jay Will's Jay Will. <laughs> yes. And, and I said because <laughs> he doesn't make mistakes with the ball, and, and Jay Will's going to. Yes. And you know we weren't thinking anything past Jay Will at that time. Right. You know, and I said just if just if there's a way of getting somebody to guard to help him because he's not going to defend. Right. Help him. Didn't know that actually later Bib become any be worse. Probably. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> you are correct. <laughs> but but I said you know it'd be a perfect fit i think to settle and you know we're hoping this could maybe help settle yes jay will down because yeah. he's marvelous talent oh my and, god and and then page so we we can take a step forward and of wow. course uh, it's true you know and i think too of the uh, the thing i always say with a lot of times fans think about trades you know they always think in terms of well let's let's trade our two or three guys we don't think's very good and get their really good guy <laughs> i said no it don't work don't that work way. that way you know if you want a really good player you you're going to have to give up a really good player and the kings did and yeah. of course it worked for corliss you know he yeah. ended up being a sixth man of the year and no got doubt. to play on a championship team and it worked for you and it worked for the kings yes it that's certainly interesting it worked for the kings but but i always say that's you know that's kind of how it went. and and like i say it, it did seem to you know i mean amazingly I think you did have a good effect on on Jay Will. Not that anybody could at that time, time. At that harness time. them. No, no, it'd, right. That'd be like trying to, you know, <laughs> uh, put a, you know, I don't know, four hundred pound man on a thoroughbred. You know, it couldn't be done. Not happening. No, it was uh, Jay Will was because earlier I, I said to you that I had lost the love for basketball. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it started coming back in Toronto, but when I got here. It was full fledged. I, I I was so excited to go to the gym every day. I, I couldn't even tell you. I the first time we were in a preseason game that I, I can remember. It might not have been the very first first time, but we were at Arco Arena, and Jay Will's dribbling the ball down the floor, and he passes it to me, and all at the same time he says, "Shoot it, shorty." <laughs> And I was thinking, what did he just say? You know, like, we're having fun. You know what I mean? And so for I, I love Jay Will to this day because he gave me the love back. The, like, the, there was a childishness about the way that he approached the game. And that's that's where I had came from. Right. And, and, I, and I went right back there. Bang. But I also did it with the professionalism and all the different things. So to me... Sacramento, that's why, like, you know, coming back here, I, I, I feel like I have unfinished business. I, I, I want to see a championship here, like, so bad. I, oh, I can't yeah. even, because we were, were so close. So it, for me, it was like basketball nirvana. It was like the greatest, like, you're beating the hell out of people every night. And you're having fun. And you're doing it with people that you enjoy being around. What? I mean, yeah. and I'm getting paid. Yeah. How about that? <laughs> well, too, it's one of those things I always remember. I mean, honestly, as far as just selfishly, I, I enjoyed going to practice so much. Wow. I mean, and, and you know, quite honestly, I don't really care about practice anymore. I'm <laughs> burnt out on it. But, but I mean, it was just such a fun bunch to watch. It was, you know, you guys were so skilled. Yes. And you're having fun. You know, I mean... Bloody, or you remember him? He'd be at every practice. I mean, he might show walk up, in show, show up right in his, as it's starting. Yeah, might walk, <laughs> show up in his pajamas, but he'd be there, <laughs> you know. And, and I mean, oh. and and Jay will I always say would would do something that that you didn't think was possible to do every day, uh, something good or bad. Yes, good and bad both. Uh, you know, I always say that I I worked a little bit volunteer wise with. A, the Atlanta Hawks years ago when Pete Maravich was there oh, you know, as a wow. college coach and I had to go over and help because in those days they had one assistant so you know I knew Cotton Fitzsimmons well and, and he really? had me come over and and, uh, and I always said that was the thing about Pete he'd do something you'd say no you can't do that <laughs> You know that's not possible. <laughs> you know. <laughs> oh my! <laughs> but but I mean, but J and Jay Will was like, I only he'd do it faster. Yes, no <laughs> doubt. And it, I would I would just be like Jay Will, and then uh, do that again, and it, he would be able to. You know what? 
as as I watch the Kings today, and I've watched them since I've been back, and I, I hear people around the league talk, and as I train athletes, and and you and I have talked about coaching, and I have my my own ideas about it. One of the greatest things that I I saw because when people t- came to our games, in my opinion, now they came to a show, mm-hmm. but we rehearsed it. And we would like run that corner series, oh, and we would start, thing. and and we would pass to Vlade, and then everyone would get to shoot. There would be three people, so Vlade's at the elbow or Chris, and then I'm at the wing, and Bobby's in the corner, and I'd pass to Chris, and then I'd go screen Bobby, or Bobby would come screen me, or I'd pass to Bobby and go screen, and we we'd be having fun and talking and laughing, but we would cover every possible option of what could happen and then it changed because every single person liked something different Peja wanted to shoot the three so the screen that i had to set for him made the guy go underneath bobby wanted to get downhill so the screen i set for him yeah. and then it was a behind the back pass and over the and i never realized those fundamentals we practiced we did that every day every it was day. like three lines yep. which i hated yeah but now I learned to love something that was so monotonous, but by the time the people got to see it, it was so polished. And I don't understand. We I watched these guys, and I'm thinking fundamentally, like, why wouldn't you do that? Well, you know what I mean? Yo, you know I what do. I'm I mean, I, I was going to say, I mean, that was, you guys were definitely ahead of the curve, bringing five-man basketball yes. back. Yes. You know, where everybody's involved. Like the Knicks and the yeah. Sonics. And, yeah. Yes. You know, some of the, and even uh, the early mm. 80s of the Lakers mm. and the Celtics. Yes, where Celtics. They, they were, they truly had everybody involved in the offense. And, and, and somehow the league had gotten away from that. It became ISO ball or yep. two-man game, game. And, and stuff. And, and quite honestly, it, the league is getting back to a lot of that yeah, again. It is. And, uh, and I'm like you. It's like, wait a minute. Duh, yeah. Do you not? You know, Steve Kerr. So when I came back here and I did my, my very first night, Arco Arena, and if you look back, it was the year that they won their first championship. Yeah. It was open at night. It was Golden State in Sacramento. So uh, I'm doing radio. And uh, they say, oh, there's a scrum and you can go talk to Steve Kerr. So I'm thinking to myself as I'm, uh, as a whole bunch of people, I'm like, I got a question, but I don't really want to ask it. Yeah. You know, this is, <laughs> this is night number one. Don't ask the question. So after it was done, he goes, hey, Doug. So now I'm going to ask my question. Mm-hmm. No one's around. So I said, hey, Steve, you know, what are you going to do different than Mark Jackson did? And he looked at me and he goes, I'm going to be honest. He said, we're going to steal what you guys did we're gonna put bogut at the free throw line we're gonna pass and cut and move and everyone's involved Mm -hmm. and the unfortunate part is we don't get credit because we didn't win a championship right uh but i i would agree with you that was the first time when i cut through a lane and the ball ended up in my hands because before then you're right it was two-man game iso ball throw it to the big guy move the hell out of the way yeah or it was a pick and roll get on the other side and now all of a sudden everyone's involved. That is how the game's supposed to be played. Yeah. yeah. And, and and you know, by rules you can play it that way. I always say when I came to the league, uh, they had rules like basically, you know, Mark Eaton or something. Mm-hmm. With big guys, you'd st- set them out there above the free and you had to guard them. Yep. In the parking lot, as yeah. they say. You had you yes. waste a defender on somebody who wasn't trying to score. Yep. I always hated it. I, I did too. Like co- what is that? You know, in college you wouldn't get by, you know, but yeah. that was Don Nelson got that pushed through because he had centers that couldn't play. <laughs> and so I mean really <laughs> Yes, you're right. I mean, I'll give him all the credit in the world. Right. Smart enough to smart enough to be, figure be, it out. Be, be, being ahead of the game a little bit. But but like say the the rules really allow you to play and and like you said i think with golden state the thing really really love the way they played at their best because people always thought well it's all about three-point shooting mm, but it wasn't no they 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 th- cuts yep. to the basket yes uh you know they, they didn't even play some post up uh, but yeah. i mean it was a the full five-man game it was to be honest with you it, to, to get the three-pointer everything is um opposites it's like yin and yang so to get the three i got to get a layup to make you 
so if I hit a jump shot, now you respect it. I get the layup because you respect the jump shot. Right. If I show that I go by you, now you back up. So now I get the, it, and that's how they play. It wasn't, I would agree with you. It, it wasn't just threes. Did they shoot a lot of them? Sure. Yeah, they did. They kind of ushered that in because they had a couple had of guys that could snipe. Rates. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I mean, they, they were looking for layups. They were looking to, you know, um, Ultimately. And then even the mid-range shots. They, you know, yes. Clay and Steph more than happy to step inside and take an, an open 17-footer. And, and, and knock it down. Uh, yeah. I, do you remember when we played against, um, it was Don Nelson's team, the uh, Dallas Mavericks. Mm -hmm. And after we beat them in the playoffs, they had those big banners up in their practice facility showing all the layups that we got against them. And it was, the numbers were gaudy. I gaudy. was like, yeah. goodness gracious, we were getting that many layups? Yeah. But that's what happens when you move people around. Yeah. Uh, th which brings me back to my point is, I don't get it today. Like, But if you don't practice the fundamentals of the game, which takes us all the way back to the beginning of the conversation, it, the game doesn't work for you. Yeah, you know, too, and I'm, I've got, I'm, I know I'm too old school and uh, I can't change, but I mean the idea that somehow it's either a three-point shot or a layup or nothing else. I'll never get there because yeah. I know that you, if you can convince me that a 35% shot, saving three, which is as good as it could be a 70% 15-foot wide open jump shot. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, I know, th and that's where, uh, li listen, I, I think analytics are a tool tool in the box yes and when i need it i use it like particularly towards the end of the game or in the scouting report you got a guy who shoots 40 a guy who shoots 30 and a guy who shoots 20 that's a b and c well the quiz is open your eyes which one do you run to mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. you, well you're going to run to the guy who's shooting 40 percent. these two you're not going to run but to to make it to make analytics say I'm going to do it because of this and take out heart and effort and enthusiasm and all the things that you can't quantify. That drives me nuts. Well, the other thing I always remember talking to an analytics guy, you know, after a game, the Kings had lost us as well after you guys were gone, but, but he was saying, you know, coach should have taken out so-and-so because he was like one for 10 in the first half. You know, he's right. really just not, not going to be productive, wasn't productive. And I said, you know, how do you know, how he's going to be in the second. He's one of your best players. I mean, to me, that's that that's the difference between actually having a feel of the game, coaching, and and yes, and, and some numbers that because you, you know, yeah. I always I always go back to as a JUCO coach and, and Bob McAdoo. I always remember him. One of the reasons he was, I think, great. He, he, you know, he was like two for eleven. I was chewing him out or something like that. And he said, "Well, you know, if you can get me about twice as many shots, I'll make twice as many matches." <laughs> You know, I mean, he, he had no, you know. That makes sense said, to me. Yeah, it really, it, it came to, I finally figured it out. It's like, yeah, that's what'll happen, you know. But that's also, it goes back to fundamentals. Listen, if you miss a couple threes, you should drive to the basket. How about getting in the penalty, getting to the free throw line? I, I remember. Get your confidence yeah, up. And R Ricky Pierce, uh, Dell Ellis. Oh, some, boy. The, you get those guys to the free throw line, they see it go in see once. It go you in. can forget about it. Yep. You know what I mean? I'm like, I'm trying to play defense and not foul because that's the last place you want to see them. Bang, bang, the next three is definitely going in. But it, it now it's it's just unconscious. Just shoot, 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 yeah. shoot, shoot. Yeah, I mean, I, and I, I don't have a really a problem with, shooting threes in transition even if a guy you know is throwing ahead his feet are set mm -hmm. you know he's comfortable absolutely but but pushing it into it and then off the dribble and being challenged and yes. i mean to me those are bad shots yeah and it, it, it in my opinion it goes against the principles of the game of you know m move the ball from side one to side two see if you can exploit there's a cat and mouse part of it too as opposed to just and you know baseball is seeing this with launch angles and different oh, things yeah. now you know there ain't no bunting no more you know you're not moving a guy from first to second mm -hmm. <laughs> you know just swing for the fence yeah so but that's all analytics which is th there's gray people it's not just black and it's not just white no. there are shades of gray and the team's who ultimately play in those areas, they are the ones that win, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at Kawhi Leonard, he's not, I mean, he shoots the three. Yeah. The last year, 
mid range all mid-range, day. Mid range, mid range, and jewelry. And and you know, and, and he's not what you call a great athlete. No, he's a good athlete. Yes, he is. You know, with huge hand. But I mean, Man. He's, he's not explosive quickness or anything. But it's fundamental and sound and sound Whew. and just keeps keeps breaking you down with what he's good at. Yes, and that's uh, I mean, that's why I whenever I I'm working with I, I, I preach the fundamentals. I know that it's it may be boring, but you look at a guy like Kobe and. To him, boring was the most spectacular thing in the <laughs> oh, world, right? Yeah. yeah. I, my first year here, um, we made the playoffs, and the Lakers swept us. Mm-hmm. So I'm having a bit of success against him, and he's shooting, and and I'm right on top of it, hands in his face, just boom, right on top of it, and he's missing. And the next year, we come back, and, and it might have been a preseason, I can't remember, but I'm, I'm, so I'm thinking – we're going to do the same thing, mm-hmm. right? Right on top of it. But the sound that I hear behind me is whoosh. <laughs> I mean, he's probably spent all summer with a hand in his face to the point where he could close his eyes. Mm-hmm. But that was the length, the distance that he was willing to go. That's why I, I, I respect how he went about his business because that is, for a lot of players, that would be boring. Mm-hmm. For him, it was the most spectacular thing of all time. Well, I do think he had the same drive as Jordan, you know. Yeah. I mean, really, I mean, he he, he, he was just so focused. So focused. And, and, and I mean, just a relentless yeah. scorer. And, uh, it, yeah, I, I, you know, it's one of those things that, you know, in many ways maybe he's even Michael's equal. I don't know that he was, but it, awfully darn close. Yeah, he. I think out of everyone, he probably got as close as, as you could get. As a scorer every, he did, I yeah. think. Yeah, yeah. Um, Michael was a different animal. Well, he was. Uh, huh? he, he was He was different. You know, so we're playing them in Toronto, 72 and 10. And one of those losses is against the lowly Raptors. I'll be darned. And you remember Alvin uh, Robertson? Yeah, sure. Yes. So I'm guarding Mike most of the game. and But he and Mike are friends, you know, played on an uh, Olympic team together. And Daryl Walker's our coach. And Daryl goes, it's a last play of the game. And Daryl goes, all right, Alvin, you're going you're gonna to get Michael, blah, blah, blah. And he starts talking and everyone kind of gets quiet because Alvin didn't say anything. And uh, so we all kind of look at Alvin like, what? And he goes, he goes, Daryl. You know, Doug's really been guarding him. Give the kid a shot. Let him let him stick him. And I'm thinking, first of all, I'm thinking, damn, oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it worked. But what I gained out of that game is he would hit me and I would hit him and we were pulling and fighting and never once did he ever say anything to the referee. Never, ever. I respected that so much out of him. He just, he's like, I'm going to handle it. Mm-hmm. right here and if he did he would walk over to the ref and he would put his shirt over his head so that he isn't disrespecting the ref and showing him up yeah. but let me get my point across there was probably a couple bleeps in there but the point sure. is and i always thought out of all the great players because i i guarded kobe and lebron and, and that guy was different mm-hmm. i had never experienced anything like that that's why i put him uh mj on a different pedestal than when i when i look at the well, rest I think of you them. about have to yeah I he, do. he uh, was special I, I i mean and i always remember just you know in his earlier career in fourth or fifth year when he was the greatest scorer in the league he's also the best defender yes I always, oh i'll never forget the game he we were playing him in in the old chicago stadium and and late in the game and we were we had a, kind of a chance to win and he gets Reggie Theus had had a strong game, and, right. and he switched off to Reggie, and Reggie couldn't get off a shot. Nah. I mean, I mean, could not get, get off, off a shot. shot. I mean, that's saying a lot. Yeah, I mean, he. he if you know Reggie, and, Reggie likes oh, to shoot he first gladly, of all. He would have <laughs> took a run and hook if he could have got one. <laughs> yeah, off. exactly. <laughs> but he couldn't. I mean, that was like, oh, that's when it kind of like dawned on me, like, holy cow, this he guy is the he, real he, deal. Is, yeah, this. He God was, don't make many of these. No, it, because it, it was the it was the drive and the determination and the will like you know there was no internet there was no twitter and all that so he looked he would get a newspaper he had the people get a newspaper the next day in the city that he just left to read it to look for motivation to oh you said that oh next mm-hmm. time i see you here's 55 <laughs> yeah, and, I, and i loved it too the fact you know he was a late developer yes you know, wasn't heavily recruited right until his senior year and yeah you know went to but but even then wasn't considered one of the top 20 or 30 yes you know and so i always say 
you know, beware of the sure thing, high school American kind of thing. No doubt. Uh, that most of the true greats, if you look at them, aren't. Aren't. No. It, they, they're they kind of late. The, little the chip Elijah on the Wands shoulders. And Duncans and, uh, you know, I mean, Man. almost go down the list. I mean, there's a few, you know, the LeBrons are the exception to every rule. Right. But, yeah. but uh, not many of those. But, hey, I wanted to kind of get into you. You know, now you know. Obviously, your your career is, is what it was. A two, mm-hmm. several time uh, defensive player of the year, and, and and obviously played on great teams with the Kings. And I think people are, are you know are aware of that. And but I think now it's a little different phase of your life. Obviously. Oh boy, yeah. I mean, you've done radio, you're doing TV, and yeah. And obviously, I, I I just you know just from a personal point of view, I enjoy watching you because you bring a a player's perspective. To what's happening on the court, you know. Yes. I mean, that's, you know, I've always said I, there's, I've never, I've always respected that to where players really understand the game. Mm-hmm. And there's, mm-hmm. I just know my brief uh, experience in the league, you know, there's been just been a few players that, that I, I think really got it the whole game. Right. You know, like in my mind, the Danny Ainge's. Uh huh. I, I mean, in my mind, a lot like yourself. I mean, really, really you understood. You just compare me exactly. to Danny Ainge. Oh boy. Well, I mean, well, <laughs> thank you, I sir. Mean, well, I mean, I mean, Mike Woodson and Eddie John, yes. all those guys. I mean, you knew they they knew not just the game, but they mm-hmm. they knew it from as a team. Uh, they also looked at it from their own p- point of view, and I think that's very different. I think a lot of players know from their position. Yes, you know, oddly enough, what I, I started trying to do is I tried to learn every single position on the floor, and I, what I I say is a macro view, meaning that when I look at basketball, uh, a lot of it's the big vision, it, yes. and it doesn't matter if it's the individual or the team. The big vision for the individual is if I give them a ball and I say uh, do inside out and shoot a shot. Well, there's a lot of little pieces that go to making that happen, and that's why as I I, as I look, whether it's uh, like I say, individual or a team, I try to, I try to dissect whether it's it, because I, I enjoy listening to you because you you had fun while you did it. Yeah, uh, Terry Bradshaw. Yeah, I, I like him. He yeah. has fun. Fun. Yeah. But then um, th- there's there's people like Hubie Brown, one of my favorites. I give you a clinic. He yeah. teaches you. Yeah. So I, I've kind of plagiarized a lot of you guys. And yeah. I, I try to bring all that. To, I like to have fun, but at the same time, I love the game of basketball. I love the nuances of the game. And that's what, when I'm looking, because I kind of bring a little bit of how I studied a player to the way I go about it. Because, you know, you're playing against Kobe Bryant. You're looking for any little Thing, a nuance. Yeah. I'll give you one for uh, LeBron. LeBron dribbles a ball, and I said this like three or four years ago, and I was surprised no one ever picked it up. But when he's dribbling the ball behind the three point line, if he looks down at it, he's about to shoot. About it. to shoot it. And as a defender, I would jump all over that because mm-hmm. I'm looking for anything. So when I, the thing with Kobe in the face, Kobe was so fanatical, he took he took it away from you. He mm-hmm. didn't allow you to have that. And that's a powerful thing because some guys can't get out of their own way, meaning that if they have a habit, they're going to stay in that habit. Yeah. And that's when I'm when I'm watching whether a guy likes to lace the ball up before he shoots it, meaning get the lines all mm-hmm. lined up. Because some guys, uh, Buddy likes to do that. Yeah. He catches it and he tries yeah. to line yeah, it up real it quick. Extra slow to... And that little extra time in this game mm-hmm. is a difference in getting your shot off and not getting the shot mm-hmm. off. And I'm jumped on your leg and I'm biting, holding on tight. Yeah. So when I'm, when I'm talking about it, those are the type of things that I try to look for too. And at the same time, try to, try to have fun. Some people like it. Some people don't. <laughs> well, sure. I mean, you're never going to, that's the only thing about it. I mean, Absolutely. you're never going to satisfy everybody. You know, I always say too, I, I think the, the guy I, I liked the most on TV was Steve Kerr. When he, did. he was good. Because, I agree. You know, I mean, that's he had a great one. sense of humor yes. and yet, you know, gave you a, Yes. You know, gave you his, his thoughts on the game and the important yeah. issues, things like that. I always thought that, uh, to me, he was, I think a lot of the national guys, I, I, I don't enjoy as much because they, they seem to me to talk over the game instead of about the game. Yes. You know, I always say, well, I, I tuned in to watch the game. <laughs> tell, me, tell me about what's going on here. Now, I, I realize if it's 30 points down and late. Yeah, now we got to come up with you some gotta, stuff. You got to, but, but I mean, it's like, well, no, I don't need to know. All the right. stuff off the court. <laughs> I don't know. care. So anyway, that's, absolutely. But, but uh, yeah, uh, you know, I mean, it's just kind of a, uh, you know, kind of interesting, you know. Too. I mean, you've been through the whole thing in the league. I mean, when you came in the league, 
you know, teams had a couple of assistant coaches. Oh, wow. Now you, you know, basically you have what six or seven and Easy. a bunch of development coaches and all that. And I'm always happy to have see guys have jobs. People have jobs and gals, but but I mean, I do think it's it. A head coach now seems to be almost more of a uh, like a football coach, a, a CEO. Almost. Yes. You know, because you got it's different. You know, it's different. You know, um, so uh, God rest his soul, David uh, David Stern, who just yes. passed away. Yes. When he came into the NBA in '84, uh, he had 24 people that worked in the league office with him. 24. 24. And now this is a global, massive empire. So when we we look and we talk about coaching, I think coaching today, in my opinion is much more psychology and player development mm -hmm. because you're getting the player at such a young age that unless they got some just tremendous coaching before you got them, think about De'Aaron Fox. Mm -hmm. He goes through high school. He probably plays AAU. AAU coaching, in my opinion, not to kill, because there are some good AAU coaches out but there, but a, a lot, it's uh, yeah. a factory, well, yeah. okay? So you got that for four years, plus whatever you get in high school. Then he goes to Kentucky for well, five months. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, yeah. that's, and so now he's yours. And if you cannot develop the player, but the problem with developing the player, it's not the same way that it used to be. Meaning that you can't say, Doug, get your butt out there and do it. And I go, yes, sir. Now it's kind of like, well, what I want to do that for? You know, like, so it's the psychology of getting in and getting to know them so that they trust you enough to listen and respect and be willing to sacrifice of their time <laughs> yeah. imagine that to do whatever it is it, it's 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 changed so much and the people who get that and understand that in my opinion in the nba are going to in, in pro professional sports in general are going to have a lot of success and those that don't are going to have constant new coaches coming in and they will perpetually be at the bottom of the league in my well, opinion I, I couldn't agree more there i mean it really is true i think the game has changed no question yeah. and these and and i do think that a lot of like you say a lot of the, the young players really do uh need the fundamentals mm. need need coach need taught need more patience and, and discipline as well yes all the, all the above and and uh you know because they're just not ready i mean there's just so few that are ready to you know, to, to be to, successful to be right successful. away. I always say, even uh, you know, you look at the great success that a Trey Young or Luca Doncic, Doncic is having, but but there's some issues there. I mean, the, yeah. probably it, it's not their fault necessarily. I mean, yeah, probably over, over handling a little bit. Mm -hmm. and, you know, they'll take some bad shots and all that. I mean, at some point, they probably both really need to be reeled back a little bit. Oh yes, uh, and I mean, and uh, you know, because they can be major stars regardless you oh, know yeah. you know and and you know it's kind of a little bit even the great jordan you know i mean oh, uh, yeah. phil jackson said, yes well, you don't Good need point. to score 37 30 will work and the seven goes to your teammates they're yes. involved now they feel like they want to run harder and work at yeah, all the different all, things all that go that. yeah even with with luca because we have that the the great you know debate uh, about luca's been a professional since he was 14 years oh, old. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's playing against grown men. And people go, well, what really does that do? Well, as soon as you, because I grew up playing against grown men with alcohol on their breath on the playground, <laughs> yeah. okay? So I don't get to shoot right now. Yeah. You give me the ball, kid. Well, that's the same thing that happened to him. So now what do you do? You learn how to play out there. You learn how to not make and mistakes fit and, and, and fit in and, and all the nuances. And do, yeah. And then slowly you work your way up to where you're the man. Mm -hmm. But it takes a second. Well, you know, the other thing on that too is I always tell people, I said, you know, 30 years ago, the, you know, being a, a top European player playing against the cup didn't mean as much. Not a, no. Now, I mean... What what the, the top European players are playing against is way better than, than, than college. What you, what, in college, used to be if you took North Carolina, one of the best team, yeah. college teams to Europe, they'd kick kick, yep. kick their butts. Yep. Now it's nah. just the opposite. Uh, they yes. will get destroyed over there. <laughs> yes, they will. And, and that's what's changed. And I think a lot of times fans and the media don't understand that. You know, oddly enough, I, I was talking to um, Peja and Vlade, uh, or I think it was just Peja about this, and 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 he was saying that it things have changed. Here, 
we run our kids through cones and they play AAU basketball. But over there, they play on the playground. Mm-hmm. And that's why when you see a guy like uh, Nurkic and uh, Jokic and these the skilled guys, and you're like, wow, you know, th- like the nuances. Well, well, they've been taught like yes. Americans used to be. Exactly. And I mean, that's, the, that's yeah. the flip. They've, they've been brought up to, right. with the fundamentals. and Which and I blows mean, yeah, me like away. You say, yeah, Nurkic, I mean, uh, Jokic, I watched him last night. You know, I mean, he's, he's slow. You think, how can this guy do it? He's the old guy on the court that you go, yeah. Why does he keep winning? Yeah. What is it about? You can't stop that guy. Yeah. Just back backs you down, shoots over you, makes all the passes, Passes. has all the passes. Oh. Yeah. No. It's a, you know, it it is a little bit of a throwback. Yes. uh, Mentality to the the game. No doubt. I. I, uh, Well, anyway, it's. I mean, it it is really interesting, you know, because I I I think it, uh, you know, the game is you know kind of evolving it always is evolving one way or another i i i, I sense i i think that probably the three-point shot is overdone now yeah i, I love it right. but but i think it's been good because it gives smaller players more skilled players a yes. chance to play on the floor as opposed to you know back in the 60s and 70s when i started watching it was just a power game a small guard had no chance because mm-hmm. they just knock him around and <laughs> And beat him up, you know, back, yes. back him down. Right. So, so you know, now you got you know space, and space, and and all that. But but I, my, I just asked your opinion on this. Uh, I was, I'm convinced that the league should eliminate the corner three. You know, just take the arch and then take it out to the to the sideline. And and to me, what it would do. First of all, it's a cheaper shot, so that's why I don't think it's worth three. But but I mean, get back to the fast breaks in the open court. Yes, guys. Going hard to the basket. And you know, oddly enough, as you say that, Jerry, because I agree with you. But do you remember where where players used to run the lanes and then they'd run all the way through? Oh yeah. Well, now guys, because of that corner three, they stop. They stop. And it 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 messes up the flow of the game. It it, it there's so many different aspects. And I think that I, I think you make a valuable point. You you draw that line right into the sidelines. Boom. So now everything above that is a three pointer, and everything below that is a two. And if you're below that, you better be moving around and, and yeah, like making. Yeah, like you say, you you come down on fast break, and and guys are blasting to the basket. And I and, and I know you know fans say, "Well, the three point shots a lot." I, I agree. I agree. But too. there's enough of them. Yes, and they're worth it out there. But but to me, boy, how much fun is a guy just blasting his way to the basket on a three on two or three or something like yeah. that and, and, and lay up or dunk? Part of why guys sit in the corner when there's a pick and roll on one side and the ball moves around and then it, and then they go, okay, it's going to swing all the way to the corner. Well, because it's still worth three points. Yeah. Whereas now you you're going to have to think outside the box and, and you be might, creative. And you might get a little more post play, which I still think you know. I, I to me. That's part of basketball. Yes, Big it guys is. Should be allowed to post up. Oh, or, no doubt. Or, or small guys, guys or small guys. Alex that are English post players. You know, I mean, like a Harris Mart, flash him down there, post him up. You yes. have an advantage. Oh. Uh, I just think it makes for would make for better basketball. Uh, you need to write the league. Let them know. You this know, is I, Jerry I, Reynolds. I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> and they say, "Well, go away. <laughs> <laughs> You're old. Go away. Don't come back." <laughs> but anyway. Well, I, I know you've got other things to do today, but I, I tell you what, this has been just a blast. Yes, you sir. know, I always, you know, I tell people all the time, you know, when you get to talk basketball with Doug Christie, you can, you can learn a lot. I, That's a blessing. But I mean, you've, you've probably got, you know, you've had a marvelous career and I, I think it, 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 you can see why from, you know, how you prepared yourself that. and how yes. you've sacrificed. I mean, to me, that's what's supposed to happen. I agree. You know that. Uh, okay, I, you know, got the talent. Got to find a way to, to, to make it work. Make it work. Yes, and, sir. And uh, you know, of course, you know. I besides being terrific on TV, I tell you all the time. By the way, that be a great coach. But yeah. but uh, you know that one day you never know. You never know. Yes, no, you never this know. Is true. You never know. And uh, you know, may not. You may even if you do it, you might say, "Hey, this is ridiculous." I, don't want to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt that. I enjoy teaching, man. It, it, there's there's nothing like it. It's a beautiful game. Plus, Jerry, and you know this. I hate watching bad basketball. Oh. It's the worst thing of all time, oh, man. It, 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 oh, I just just yeah, make you well, please, Chuck. Yeah, yeah. Uh, make it beautiful, man. <laughs> How would you say? You know, years ago when I was young and and you know, I, I the happiest I would be with, and co- especially a college division would be. 
have me a rack of balls uh -huh. and a two, three hour to, to practice. Yeah. You know, nothing I mean, like just, it. I mean, nothing like it. Yes. And uh, so anyway, but uh, I want to just take this moment then to, to thank uh, Doug Christie. And, thank you, sir. And, uh, you know, maybe we can do this again sometime. Anytime, and, uh, Jerry, but, let me know. Uh, you know, one of the all time greats here in Sacramento. And I know you enjoyed watching him play and you enjoy uh, listening and uh, watching him on television and uh, keep doing it. Thank you, sir. So this is uh, the Jerry Reynolds Show, such as it is.